guys. Welcome to the Trial Site News Podcast. I'm Dr. Erin Kate Stair, your host. And today we're going to be focusing on the relationship between obesity and COVID-19. Um, we've heard quite a bit about it, but I'm excited um, to introduce you to our guest today, Dr. Barry Popkin. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and my first question actually is if you don't mind to take a few minutes to introduce yourself and the type of work you do. So I, my name is Barry Popkin. I'm both an economist and a nutrition epidemiologist so, and work in the health area. Particularly, I work in healthy eating and uh, obesity related issues. I'm a keen and distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, in the School of Public Health there. Thank you. That's fantastic. So, so we know obesity rates are increasing around the globe. And you recently published a paper, which I read in obesity reviews titled Individuals with Obesity and COVID-19, a global perspective on the epidemiology and biological relationships. So to kind of jump right in, um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between obesity and getting COVID-19, your chance of getting a more serious illness and ending up in the hospital and your chance of dying. Okay, so for background, most of the research has been done before the Delta variant hit, hit, hit us. So that this research is a little bit outdated in the sense of the risk levels, but it will still be the same relative differential, meaning that a person who's overweight or obese will be more at risk than a person who is normal weight. Um, and as your weight goes up, your BMI, your body mass index, which is really the measure that's used to talk about overweight and obesity, um, it, there will be an increasing risk. Uh, from my research, I'll go specifically into some of the differentials, but I want to note that one study done in England with 6 million patients who were monitored in the country through the national health system where they have very detailed records on their weight, and then they've been followed and they know their health records and they have their testing scores in there and all of that. that Actually, at a BMI of around 25 and up, it go, the risk goes up, up, up continuously. So that what I'm talking about is data based on being obese, which is a more severe category of this, and your risk will be higher than they would be with just being overweight. But they are continuous. So this is an effect of increased roundness fat, overweight status will actually worsen your risk to COVID at any level. It's what we know from the English study and a few others that have come up. So in my case, when we found this based on all the major studies around the world that were carefully controlled, where they had information on weight, before and they had their risk and then uh, had followed them to know where they were in the hospital process. Uh, we find about 46% increased risk of going into a hospital, of getting COVID. So we know that if you're overweight or obese, and as you increasingly get more obese, you're more at risk of catching COVID because your immune system is weakened. And we all have some exposure to a few of the droplets that contain the virus wherever we are. But the question is volume and concentration. And it takes less exposure for the overweight and obese individuals to, be, to get COVID. So that's the first thing we know. But what we know that is really important is that for hospitalization, you're double the likelihood. You're 113% more likely. That's more than double the risk of 
a normal weight person of going into the hospital if you're overweight or obese. So the obesity really matters at that level. And what we also know is that once you're in the hospital, there's a greater risk of going into the ICU. And there's a greater, of, of essentially 75% greater likelihood of an overweight, obese person in the hospital going in to the intensive care unit over other individuals. So it's almost double, not quite, but it's a really high likelihood. And uh, for mortality, the, it's about a 50% increase. So 48% is what we found in the dozens of studies we looked at and looked at uh, an average effect. So that in all these situations, whether it's going into the, getting COVID, going into a hospital, going into an intensive care unit, going in for a, needing a ventilator and dying, your risks are at least 50% higher. And for hospitalization, 100% higher, 113% higher, so more than double. And the same goes, it's a higher risk for everything. So the health impact of being obese on adults, the health impact of that in terms of COVID is really very severe. And that's Absolutely. anybody of any race, ethnic background, right. that is the situation. And I remember uh, reading, it might've been one of the CDC's weekly morbidity and mortality reports, but, and we know that age is the most significant risk factor for, for severe COVID-19, but is it true? And did you find this in your research that the impact of obesity on severe COVID increases in the younger age groups? Is that yes, what that? It, yes, it's in all age groups. That is the reality. We don't really have enough research to know about this for children, but we know once you're into late adolescence and later, that is the situation. This is irrespective of age. So now with the Delta variant, which is more contagious, it's even more of an issue. Uh, right, that's an excellent so. point, yeah. And you mentioned earlier and you talked about, you wrote about it in your paper, some of the mechanisms why obesity makes COVID-19 worse. And I know that it, you know, COVID-19 is one example, but I also know that you guys talk, uh, you touched on the fact that obesity can make a lot of respiratory viruses worse. Can you just mention some of the ways, reasons why obesity does that? Yeah, let, let me try to explain to people. As soon as you have fat, to, fat cells in your body and you're becoming overweight and obese, those fat cells from the beginning are, are become inflamed. They produce certain negative inflammatory properties from the beginning. So as you get more overweight and obese, they accumulate. And overweight and obesity is not a one-year process. It's not like getting hypertension and having a problem. This is an accumulative process. So these fat cells are constantly getting inflamed and they're constantly impacting our immune system. Uh, and those effects are really very important. There are other additional effects of the fat cells that also impair us but, and, and aside from that, so let me explain in a different way. When you get vaccinated, it will be less effective when you're overweight and obese because you have a weakened immune system. So that we know for very obese individuals, we sometimes get, give them two flu shots. Uh, I know that was being done in my hospital systems, which is the biggest in North Carolina. And um, it, it's not as often as it should be because we know that the flu, the flu vaccines work much less for overweight obesity. In fact, they have usually three different titers in them affecting three different types of flu. And typically one or two of them are not effective. 
with when you're overweight and obese. We don't, we know the vaccine helps and it will help everyone, but we know it would help you more if you're normal weight than other weight. That's where the booster comes in that will be that much more important to overweight and obese people to get it once they're eligible. And if you're older and you're also overweight and obese, there's an increased risk. So age adds to that. Although with the Delta variant, we're finding because of the high vaccination rates among elderly in the US, most of the Delta variant is affecting young people more. They're the ones more likely to be unmasked. They're the ones more likely to be in big social gatherings and other things. And frankly, most of our deaths are occurring in people under the age of 50. And we're seeing deaths in, in children and adolescents increasing in our country. That's an interesting point about the vaccines and uh, you know something people should consider in their decision. I thought it was interesting though, you know, um, some of the incentives seem sort of counterintuitive, what, you know, free donuts, people were giving out French fries and stuff. And I kind of thought, <laughs> well, you know, and I kind of thought that just seems wrong given what you just said, like obesity has such a severe impact on this disease. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, here's free, you get free donuts. I think Krispy Kreme, not to knock them, but like they were giving out free donuts every day for a year, if I read that correctly. And it, someplace here in New York City was giving out cheesecakes. And I just said to myself, that doesn't seem right. Yeah, you know? no, it, 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 but on the other hand, you don't get overweight with one Krispy Kreme or with one cheesecake. It will add to your likelihood. But if that's what people want, when it comes to dealing with this vaccine, the vaccine is so important that both for that individual safety, but also for the safety of everybody around him, that it's worth it. And so these are trade-offs have been made. The way the food companies have operated that hasn't been healthy is in many, many countries around the world we've documented where they're giving out Coke or Pepsi free samples going into communities. That is wrong. That is using the COVID saying you need to be uh, well, uh, you know, have a lot of water in your system and giving you junk food or junk beverages. And that's trying to build your brand name by killing people. And that's incorrect. That's the difference between that kind of industry activity, which is huge in most countries outside the US. We don't see much of it here, because the, but we do see it literally in over a hundred countries. Um, and should, should we be talking more about obesity, you know, on the, the national level, it's kind of been, we know it's there, but, you know, I think in your paper too, I read some of these public health responses, the lockdowns, the social distancing, the economic burden might have increased food insecurity or made people choose, you know, cheaper food that was highly processed, that kind of thing. There was less activity. I don't know, maybe you can tell us if the obesity numbers, if the rate has increased over the last year and a half or not. Um, and I remember talking to a few friends and they're like, yeah, you know, our gym is closed, so I'm gaining weight. And I'm like, that's interesting. And then we're not yet. It doesn't seem to be the people who take to the microphone every day aren't really talking about obesity and the, that link to COVID-19. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it, the difficulty we have right now is we have a crisis of an economic sort with unemployment and everything related, plus the school problem. I think that this administration would like to do more in the health area like this, but they can't. Uh, they've really got the priorities to get them, the economy righted and uh, in dealing with all these other critical issues before we can get around by increasing the food stamp amount going to people, they get more money, they can buy healthier food. That's one small step forward. Uh, there are many more we hope they'll take, but their initial 
attention, of course, is going to the US at this point, including what's happening in Afghanistan is all part of kind of bringing America back to the US and focusing on the US. That, that's fair. I mean, I always tell people, you know, there was sort of, you have to address the gush, the gushing chest wound, so to speak, you know, and, and try to tackle the virus right away. But I do think that there is room now on the national level to really start talking about obesity and really trying to, and it's going to take creative solutions. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and essentially CDC called out COVID as one of the I mean, overweight and obesity as a major risk factor. So they recognize it. We recognize we need to fund our public health better and we need to go after some of these problems. But we, on the one hand, it takes more money to buy good food, healthy food. Cheap food is junk food and it's not healthy, but it really, is easy to buy and it's and it fills you up kind of. Uh, the junk food on the other hand has a lot of additives in it. Uh, anywhere from 20 to 100 different additives are put into every one of these items we call junk food in America. And all these smells and chemicals they add makes what we're eating kind of food-like, but it also makes us want more of it. It creates all sorts of of, as several psychologists created a whole field on sh fat and sugar, for example, those combinations don't, didn't exist before 100 years ago. They weren't in natural food. And they've created that and it's become quite addictive with all these chemicals after it, all these flavorings and things that we don't understand that they add increase our cravings. Yeah, that's a really interesting point to view it as an addiction when you're thinking about the approaches. My, my last question is sort of on the, the lines of what you think the best steps forward are from public health. So my understanding when it comes to obesity being labeled an epidemic in the US, it happened in the late 1990s. Uh, there was an article published in JAMA and I went back and read it and the CDC director at that time basically said, compared obesity to an infectious disease epidemic and said, we need to treat it the same way. So that was in the late 1990s. There's been initiatives at the national level, at the state level. Our obesity rate was around 30%. It's up now above 40%, maybe a little under 43, somewhere in the lower 40s. What are we doing wrong? And in your opinion, what needs to be done to actually make a difference? Well, that's a long story. But to start with, we really are not uh, tackling obesity at the national level. We're doing relatively nothing. And a lot of that has to do because of the food industry. The food industry is blocking us at every step. The only thing they couldn't block is things like uh, tests that are being done to see if they can encourage more fruit and vegetables, consumption in in food stamp programs, SNAP, and doing things in schools. Uh, but even there, under the uh, Obamacare Affordable Care Act that they passed, they wanted to ban from all schools sugary beverages. They got to do it in elementary and junior high and high school. But by middle school and high school, they got, uh, we're starting to allow them to put in diet beverages. So instead of banning completely all of these products and only allowing water and milk in the schools, they allowed in all these other kinds of things. And so the industry, but, and then we had cities starting to tax sugary beverages, which is kind of one of the low hanging fruit and gives a complete win to the health sector in terms of fighting not only obesity, but hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, uh, where it's one of the major preventive factors for all of them. Uh, it, it was put into place in five cities. A bunch more cities wanted to do it and were ready to do it. 
And the industry started buying off state legislators and putting in preemptions that said, you can't do it unless it's at the state level. And so we, we really, that, but that's just one little example. We could be doing lots of things that other countries are doing that are very effective. Taxing sugary beverages is one. Uh, another that people are doing is going after all the food that's high in added sugar, added sodium, and added saturated fat, all of which are unhealthy. And it's quite successful. In Chile, which was a higher consumer of per capita of sugary beverages than us per capita, and it's a high income country, they cut the sugary beverage consumption by a quarter, 25% reduction. What the first year of an increasingly more strict set of cutoffs to put these octagonal warning labels on food. And they banned advertising of those foods with the octagon and beverages with the octagon warning label. And they banned them completely from schools, marketing in schools, everything, and everything around the school. So that's the kind of things that countries are doing. The taxes are working. In South Africa, they taxed every extra gram of sugar in the beverage. And, and sugar consumption went down by 37% in the first year. Um, so we can do things to deal with sugar, sodium, saturated fat, all of which are way too high in our consumption in this country. And, but the industry's in the way, big time. The food industry, as we've shown in many countries where they cut these things, they don't lose any jobs. They claim they will, but they don't. The industry hasn't lost a single job in COVID and wage rates stayed the same. The same in Chile, the same in Mexico, South Africa, and every country we've studied. Uh, Philadelphia, the same. Um, huge cuts in, in consumption, but they can sell water. They can sell other things. And so the, the Cokes and Pepsis and all the other big companies and Nestle's and Kellogg's and General Mills selling us the junk food and all the dozens of other they're not going to lose. They're just going to create healthier food. And that's what we need. They can create healthier beverages. They can create healthier food and we'll buy it. And I think creating them so they're more affordable too. That's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I want healthy food, but it's too expensive. Right. But if we have more demand for it, the supply will go up, I should add, and the prices will go down. Right now, we don't have a high enough consumption, so prices are lower. But it's changing. It, it, they didn't go up during COVID. The, the vegetable and fruit prices didn't go up at all. So um, we, we uh, but they're high. And yes, sugar and junk food and all the chemicals in it are very cheap for the industry to do, to give us all these food, plant-like food. I mean, they're food-like, they're not real foods. If you saw all the chemicals in them, you'd realize that. You'd be kind of, everybody would be shocked. And each ingredient on the package of 13 to 20 items in that. And I, we have the list of all those. So when you look at a food package and you see five ingredients on it, believe me, each of those ingredients has many things in it. And when you go and think you're buying organic, then it would use high idle fruit juice concentrates instead of sugar, but it's equally unhealthy. It's just sugar. It just has a different aura because it comes from a fruit, but it's not any different. Yeah, that's that's interesting to think about. And also just we're taught focusing on obesity and COVID, but obviously, and people know this, obesity is linked to a lot of chronic conditions and increasing right. healthcare costs, which we know healthcare and, is. And you know, for the factories, I mean, most large businesses in this country are trying to do something about it because productivity goes down around 25% workers at work. At the same time, absenteeism is much higher. So food, most of the large companies are trying to do something about this and have some kind of a program. Some very successful, a and essentially cut the healthcare costs way down. No healthcare increase in a while because they really went after um, working with their staff 
to cut their overweight and obesity level. That's not true with everybody you see in the store selling to you, but that's true with all their permanent employees across the country. And there are hundreds of thousands of stores. So you, there, it can be done. There are lots of companies doing this and some very successful. Uh, maybe it would be great. Maybe there's a list somewhere we can see some of the pro so more I, successful. Not, yeah. <laughs> it's not my daily work though. So yeah. thank yeah. you very much. Take thank you, Dr. Popkin. And, you know, please come back anytime. This is very interesting. And I think it'll be helpful to our viewers too. And I'm glad good. you hey. were able to come on and talk about it. Have a good thank rest you. of your day. Bye-bye.